I'm Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and I've been here for about a year and a half since June 2013. I never expected to have the best job in the world for a constitutional uh, scholar and, and lover of all things constitutional. Uh, this place is constitutional heaven. It's a national treasure, and I'm eager to tell you all about it. But let me start by explaining how I unexpectedly ended up here. So I spent 20 years or more as uh, a law professor and journalist in Washington, D.C. My first job out of law school, I clerked for a year, and then at the age of 28 became the legal affairs editor of the New Republic magazine. Phenomenal job, which I held until I resigned just a few weeks ago, along with much of the staff. Uh, and I did a lot of legal journalism in D.C. and also have been lucky enough to teach at GW Law School for uh, a long time, since 1997. And I really had the two best jobs in the world as a law professor and a journalist. I had the pleasure of talking with, with, with you, Fabrizio, a few years ago from GW about uh, issues involving privacy and technology, uh, loved writing and uh, speaking about a variety of constitutional issues, and was very, very happy in D.C. Unexpectedly, the National Constitution Center called. They were looking for a new head and wondered if I'd be interested. My first instinct was no, because I was so happy with these two phenomenal jobs. But I went to talk to the Constitution Center Board of Trustees, and it immediately became clear that my great passion in life, which is bringing all sides together to debate not political questions, but constitutional questions, and their interests were completely aligned. Because this is the only place in America that has a charter from Congress to do just that. Our congressional charter, framed at the time of the bicentennial of the Constitution, says that the National Constitution Center has to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. So this is a private nonprofit. It's a beautiful building on Independence Mall, uh, right across from Independence Hall where the Constitution was drafted. So it's the most inspiring constitutional views in America. But it has this congressional mandate. And I became excited about the idea that in these polarized times, it was important for there to be one institution that brings together liberals and conservatives and everyone in between to debate the Constitution so that citizens can make up their own minds. And we do this in three ways. We are the museum of we the people, we are America's town hall, and we are a center for civic education. So let me tell you a little bit about each of those buckets. The Museum of We the People is this incredible building here in Philadelphia. It was designed by I.M. Pei. It opened on July 4th, 2003, and it contains some priceless documents, uh, including some ones I've just been showing to you, which include one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, along with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It includes this beautiful space, space Signers Hall, where kids can interact with life-size statues of the American framers. There's an inspiring show, Freedom Rising, which really sets the stage for everything that follows. There's a beautiful permanent exhibit uh, where kids can interact with constitutional artifacts. And there's a series of temporary exhibits on constitutional themes. So I'm so excited that we uh, will be displaying one of the original copies of the 13th Amendment signed by Abraham Lincoln, We've had uh, shows on uh, freedom of the press and on uh, the year 1968 and Jefferson and slavery. Uh, this year, the Pope is coming to Philadelphia, and we're going to have a special exhibit on religious liberty with priceless uh, documents relating to American uh, freedom of expression. And this is the only museum in America that is devoted to the most inspiring idea of liberty ever, namely the U.S. Constitution. So that's the physical place where people can visit. You can see the exhibits. You can interact with judges. We've set up an incredible new program where the judges of the Third Circuit can talk to school kids about what it's like to be a judge, and we're going to take that national so that judges around the country can interact with uh, school kids. And it's a place for people to engage with the Constitution in a very tangible way. 
But that's only one of our missions. We're also America's Town Hall and Center for Civic Education. I'm so excited to share the fact that thanks to a really generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation, we have assembled a national advisory board chaired by the uh, heads of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. Lee Otis, vice chair of the Federalist Society, Carolyn Fredrickson, the president of the American Constitution Society, joined by their co-chairs, Rick Pildes of NYU and Nick Rosencrantz of Georgetown and Cato, will be chairing this advisory board that will oversee a series of national debates about the Constitution uh, across the country this year. So for me, this is like the Lincoln-Douglas debates gone national. It's so wonderful that FedSoc and ACS will nominate debaters uh, who will talk about the great constitutional issues around the country, and we will be videoing all of those debates and posting them on our website. These debates are not only uh, going to be videoed, we're also doing them with our incredible We the People constitutional podcasts. So every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative or libertarian or anywhere in between scholar in the country about the constitutional issue of the week and interview them about what they think. These podcasts are a runaway hit. Uh, they're getting up to 300,000 downloads a month. Podbeam, which ranks 700,000 podcasts, found that we're number two in the news category and number nine overall. And I just think it's inspiring to see what a tangible response they're getting, not only across America, but also we know from Google Analytics, which shows us exactly where all of our listeners are, a creepy tool from a privacy point of view, I say as a privacy advocate, but great if you're a podcast entrepreneur. We have listeners in Botswana and China and uh, around the globe. The idea behind these podcasts is the same idea as the ones we're doing in our town hall debates. Namely, we believe there are good arguments on all sides of constitutional questions, and we think by presenting them fairly and in context, citizens can educate themselves and make up their own mind. We're also holding these debates not only on our podcast, which you can check out on iTunes and also on our website, constitutioncenter.org. We're also holding them in partnership with our friends at Intelligence Squared which has a special series that we've developed about constitutional issues. And in all of these debates, and in the Intelligence Squared debates and on our podcast, we're insisting that we can debate any issue as long as we talk not about political issues, but about constitutional issues. So what does that mean? We had our first Intelligence Squared debate about the question, does the president have the constitutional power to target and kill American citizens abroad? And we, Nick Rosencrantz and I stressed at the beginning we don't care what the audience thinks about whether drones are a good or bad idea. That's a policy question. The constitutional question is, does the Constitution allow or prohibit drone strikes without congressional authorization, or does the Fourth Amendment impose limits on these drone strikes? So the audience initially voted, and the initial vote said no, the president doesn't have the power. But after Alan Dershowitz gave the best closing argument I've ever heard, the audience switched its vote and voted yes. That was an amazing debate. We also did IQ squared debates on campaign finance reform in the First Amendment, uh, where Floyd Abrams and Nadine Strossen of the ACLU defended the Citizens United position, and Zephyr Teachout and Burt Newborn opposed it, and there the audience voted on behalf of the Newborn and Teachout side. We had a great NSA surveillance constitutional debate. We've got one coming up at Columbia Law School about the president's power to declare war without congressional authorization. And it's just very exciting that these debates, like our FedSoc ACS sponsored debates and like our podcasts, challenge citizens to transcend their political inclinations and to educate themselves enough about the Constitution to be able to reach conclusions that might even diverge from their political conclusions. And I just find it inspiring that in these polarized times, people can have civil debates about the Constitution. Sometimes there are unexpected areas of agreement. We were talking a moment ago up in the Bill of Rights Gallery about that interactive, which allows you to trace the documentary sources of the Second Amendment. And I mentioned that we had a great podcast with Michael Waldman, one of the leading defenders of the collective rights view of the Second Amendment, and Alan Gura, the leading defender of the individual rights view, who argued and won two Supreme Court cases. And Gura and Waldman disagreed about what the framers thought about whether the Second Amendment was an individual or a collective right, but unexpectedly they agreed that most regulations proposed uh, by Congress and the states to regulate guns are constitutional. Uh, so the goal of these debates is not a kind of 
kumbaya consensus or people don't have to agree. It's intelligent testing of the best arguments on both sides of the constitutional arguments so that people can make up their own mind. And I'm just inspired by the response. But that's not all. The final part of our great mission, I've talked about the Constitution Center as the Museum of We the People and America's Town Hall. Our final mission is to be a national center, I, I hope the national center for constitutional education. So thanks to the Templeton Grant, our great advisory board, with the help of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, is going to create the best interactive constitution on the web. We have divided the constitution into separate clauses, and we're going to identify the top liberal, conservative, libertarian, and every other variety of scholar, so that we can have two people debating and also agreeing about each constitutional provision. So we're going to ask scholars to write a thousand words about what they agree that each clause means historically and in terms of settled law. And then we'll ask them to write separate statements about areas of current controversy and disagreement. So for example, we're starting off by asking Rick Pildes, a co-chair of our advisory board, and Brad Smith, a leading a uh, scholar of voting rights and campaign finance to say what the 15th Amendment means. And Smith and uh, Rick Pildes will agree on a common statement about settled law in the 15th Amendment, and then they'll write separate statements about current areas of disagreement. And we're going to do that for every clause of the Constitution, and I think that's going to be an incredible uh, contribution to civic debate so that school kids, because that's the main audience for this Constitution, 7th uh, through 12th graders, can both have faith in areas of agreement and disagreement about the Constitution. And we are talking to our friends at the College Board, which has a new requirement that all kids who take the SATs uh, and AP US history and government exams study the founding documents. And we're talking about ways of distributing this great nonpartisan curriculum to help kids study for the SATs, uh, to study for the AP exams, um, as well as to meet the constitutional history requirements that our most public schools across America have uh, adopted starting in seventh grade. What unites all of these exciting projects is a faith in constitutional education and a belief that the Constitution is a conversation. I'm a teacher. That's what I've uh, done, and I will always have my great passion be constitutional education. But the longer I've taught, the less interested I am in my own opinions and views of the Constitution, and the more interested I am in hosting debates about what the Constitution means. We can learn a lot from each other by listening to the best arguments on both sides. Sometimes we can even have our minds change the way James Madison so famously did when he initially opposed a Bill of Rights, but after listening to the good arguments came to support it. So I think it is really important for there to be at least one place in America where people of both sides, of all sides, because there's always more than two sides to constitutional questions, can have faith that they will be listened to respectfully, that they'll be presented with the best arguments, and that they can have a, a, a spirited and illuminating debate about what the Constitution means. We're going to do that here at the Constitution Center in every media platform, which is why I'm so glad to be talking to Fabrizio and, 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 and Governance Works. Uh, we'll do it with our podcast. We'll do it with video. We do it here in Philadelphia. We're going to do it around the country. And I want you to think of the Constitution Center as a place you can come to get fair-minded presentation of the arguments on all sides, whether you're a lawyer or a law student or a high school kid or a adult learner interested in learning about the Constitution for the first time. We all, as citizens, have an obligation to educate ourselves about the Supreme Court, about the Constitution so that we can participate in the great conversation that is the Constitution. It's a privilege of American citizenship. I, I'm just thrilled to be part of it every day, and that's why I'm so happy to be here at the National Constitution Center. I never imagined doing anything aside from the two things that I love doing so much ever since I left law school, namely teaching and writing. I decided in law school that I wanted to be a journalist, that I did not want to be a practicing lawyer because I thought I would not be very good at it and would not uh, love it. Uh, and you've got to do what you love. And if you love being a lawyer, it's really wonderful to do it. But my passion was always writing and thinking about the Constitution. That was what really excited me. So I just 
got the best break in the world when I was hired at a young age to uh, go to the New Republic. That was through no special uh, talent on my part, but, but largely by the fact that I'd gone to college with Andrew Sullivan, who was then the editor of the New Republic. So I like to say that I'm the Harriet Myers of legal journalism. Um, but that was an amazing break at a time when the New Republic was really, but there was no internet and it was something very beautiful uh, and meaningful in American life and it was an incredible privilege. And I viewed becoming a law professor as an extension of the kind of writing I was doing at TNR, being able to absorb constitutional arguments, learn, educate myself about topics I didn't know about and, and, and share them with students. And I would have been not only happy, but felt incredibly lucky to be doing those two things. Uh, and really it was just by the coincidence that the Constitution Center reached out that I agreed to start talking to them. Uh, and I, I just feel, as I said, that I'm in constitutional heaven. That I, it's, it's really exciting uh, in, let's call it early middle age, to, to find a totally new challenge that you never could have anticipated. Um, and this is just thrilling on every level. It's a, it's a big challenge. This is a big institution. It has a large staff. We have to um, not only put on these great programs and run a museum and sponsor debates and educate kids about the Constitution, but also I have to raise money to support our activities. And this is the most important part of my job. And if you are excited about what the Constitution Center is doing, think about becoming engaged with us. You don't have to give a lot. It's more important that you just sign up on the website, become a member, and show your support for what we're doing. When I started this job, I asked a friend what fundraising would be like, because I had done a little bit of it um, at the Brookings Institution, but not a whole lot. And uh, this friend, a former law school dean, said, if you're passionate about the mission of an institution, then fundraising is not a chore, but a pleasure. And I feel that way. I really, as you'll be able to tell as we talk about this place, am very fired up about the importance and significance of the work that the Constitution Center does as an island of civility uh, in, in these polarized times. So uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm privileged to go around the country to try to meet people who are equally passionate about our mission and want to be part of it. Uh, but it's all relatively new. Um, it's all challenging. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving all of it.